Hi, good morning. Before we get going, I'd like to make a couple housekeeping announcements. Uh, first, this session is being recorded, so we will be posting it to our website uh, shortly after our session today. So if you'd like to go back and view anything, you can. Um, also, if you have questions along the way, we encourage them. Uh, we will do our best to answer questions throughout the session uh, and try to make some time at the end for questions as well. So please raise your hand and put those into the chat box and we will make sure we get to those. So thank you everybody for uh, joining us for part two of our webinar series on Microsoft uh, Enterprise Mobility Suite. This session is focused on identity as the new perimeter. Uh, in the first session, we looked at really the, the industry and uh, uh, intro to EMS. Today we're going to start digging deeper and then our third one will even go deeper. So the idea is one builds upon another. So for those uh, who are not on the first session or are not aware of who I am, my name is Tom Ross. I'm the uh, Mobility and Security Practice Manager for Cortex Services. So I am thrilled to be able to host this series. And I have a special guest with me, Chris Shelda, who is our uh, Microsoft Solutions Architect. Good morning, Chris. Good morning. All right, Tom. Yeah, so my, my name is Chris Shelda. Um, I've been with Cortex for a number of years, really started in the consulting space, and uh, just until recently was uh, enterprise consulting and doing a lot with Microsoft Solutions, Office 365, EMS, System Center, uh, virtualization, <laughs> you name it. But um, recently had become the Microsoft Solutions Architect, which now I help customers uh, kind of architect solutions around the Microsoft stack to solve you know, find creative solutions to solve business problems that they may have. Uh, when one of the, the big topics that's been coming up a lot recently has been mobility. Um, right. So, you know, that's, that's pretty much why we're here, right? Is when I kind of take a look under the covers, see where, you know, we can help uh, maybe some customers out there understand this a little bit better. There's a lot of different pieces, moving right. parts. Um, it really comes down, it's not just the technology, it's really what can I do for business. Right. right? Well, it sounds great, uh, and I have to say, since I've been with Cortec, you definitely have uh, opened my eyes to different ways to look at mobility and mobility security. Uh, I've been in my I've been in mobility my whole career, and it's really even with that experience, given me new insights, and it's it's been great. And I'm, again, I'm glad to have you here. Uh, just a real quick overview of our agenda. What we're going to do is we'll do a really brief recap of our uh, from last week. Then we're going to talk about uh, identity, and really this is an area that intrigues me. Uh, identity is the new perimeter. And then we're going to move on to safeguarding your company's information. What do I need? What's traditional? Where's the industry going? And then we're going to talk directly about EMS and how that's meeting the challenge today for our customers. Uh, Chris is actually going to be doing some demos throughout so you can see the EMS uh, topics basically applying in real life. Uh, so these will be live demos, so if uh, things hiccup, understand, Murphy may be running loose today. Yeah. Uh, and then we'll, we'll finish it up with uh, questions and answers and talk about our next session. So our first webinar last week was really talking about the changing workplace. And we posted that to our website. It's also on YouTube, so if you'd like to see that session for yourself, if you weren't able to participate, here's the URL uh, to go to, and you'll be able to see that in its entirety. So last week, I talked about the market and where's it gone. And this is important because really the paradigm has shifted so quickly that organizations are having a hard time keeping up with it. If you look at uh, devices, it really started with corporate managed devices such as BlackBerry and Windows CE, and then uh, with the introduction of the iPhone, it really started to accelerate this whole notion of consumerization or consumer-driven devices and users wanting to use their specific device and not what uh, you know, their companies have given to them. And what we've seen is that really has accelerated into a number of different form factors and uh, the new term is the Internet of Things, and that's really looking at 
other things that are connected to the internet, not just a laptop or a, a tablet or a phone. Uh, we have watches now, we have uh, industrial sensors, we have our refrigerators. Those are all on the internet and all need to be managed somehow uh, by organizations. So our challenges really, again, are the users. Our users are the new generation and they expect to use technology. Uh, they've grown up on it. They uh, want to use it in the workplace and that's really what they're used to. And companies to be able to attack, to attract that talent, excuse me, um, really has to be able to adapt but adapt securely. And that again is through the, the devices and the explosion of devices and apps. Uh, apps now on uh, phones or on tablets uh, have grown exponentially and users are going to put on things that they're comfortable with and we use the term shadow IT. Shadow IT is basically users going out on their own and putting applications or services onto their devices and using that to do their jobs. It's not malicious but it's their way of easily getting things done and that's really what you have to look now to defend against any leakage or attack vectors in those areas. And then finally, data. It's, you know, how is my company IP and my important information being protected? Uh, it is so easy, and you'll see as we go further today, how easy it is for uh, a critical piece of information in your company to quickly leak onto a uh, internet file sync and share service, for example, that isn't sanctioned by your organization. So there's a lot of challenges you face today. We then went through a, <clears throat> excuse me, a high-level uh, overview of the Microsoft Enterprise Mobility uh, suite or solution, and the subcomponents of that, which are uh, Azure Active Directory, Microsoft uh, Advanced Threat Analytics, Microsoft Intune, and Azure Rights Management. And really, what we're doing, starting with this session, is we're going to start going deeper into each one of those components of EMS. So what is identity as the new perimeter? Uh, I could have told you a while back that I didn't know what this meant. And Chris, a, a story I'll share with you is um, I was in New York yesterday calling on a client and we were talking about uh, the client's current mobility solution and locking down the devices and locking down uh, specific apps that they push out themselves. And the CIO had, had a great point. He's like, well, I'm locking down these mobile devices as tight as I can, but what about desktops, laptops, and other form factors that I'm not touching? That information potentially is right there to leak. And all of a sudden, the light bulb went off. It's like, oh, it's identity, not the device. So I don't know if you have anything as we go into this section you might want to prime uh, the audience with? Or? Yeah, I mean, really, it's we see it's this the notion of you're always following the device saying, well, we got to protect the device, protect the device. But it's not really the mobility is not really the device that's moving around. It's, it's a user experience. It's a user that's moving from device to device. Right. You know, many users have multiple devices that they're dealing with. So it's targeting and making sure that user can get done what they need to get done, but securing their identity in the process no matter which device they go to that's right. is key and paramount, especially from a, a user experience standpoint. Right. And the users... Uh, uh, today will typically have about five different devices that they utilize uh, for their life and by that extension uh, part is the part of their work as well. So you can see this is just some quick information about um, credentials and that users at this point are really mixing their personal and work tasks on their devices which is a mix of credentials. A lot of times uh, passcodes are used across both corporate and personal uh, accounts, which they shouldn't be, but they but they are. 80% uh, of employees admit to using non-approved software such as SaaS. Again, this is that whole idea of shadow IT that I talked about. It's users doing what they need to do to be productive, not necessarily malicious, but they're not necessarily looking at it from security first either. And then, again, the, the last one, 75% of network intrusions are through those exploited uh, credentials, things that are easily cracked through uh, brute force or dictionary attacks, 
So it's, it's important as part of that identity to be able to, to manage those credentials and make those strong. So this is what the current reality looks like. These are all the things that you need to look at, you need to manage. So you can see that you've got a number of different cloud services that uh, potentially your users are accessing. And you may not know all the different things that they're going to from their devices. So it's, you know, how do I get my arms around that? How do I manage it? And as Chris said earlier, still make it, you know, a, a good experience for my user where they're not feeling like I'm, you know, shutting them down. So this is, you know, what you have to look at, again, across the whole gamut from on-premise, how are things entering to the devices that they use to the, uh, you know, SaaS services and applications they use. So it's a lot. Yep, and one of the things, too, that seems it's not just so, if you look at that picture, you could be focusing on individual devices, okay, but you can't always get your, get a handle on maybe like the personal devices, right? And that's where I think some of the solutions we're talking about today will get a handle on that because it's all about the identity across all of these, the, the clouds, you know, right. on-premise and private cloud, the devices, it's the identity that's across all of them. Right. And really in this day's landscape, I mean, everybody's heard it in the news and whatever, is these cyber attacks that, you know, there's people out there maliciously for a number of reasons. It might be money, uh, it might be nation state type of stealing secrets, it might, who knows, you know, be for fun or some other cyber terrorist type of thing. Yep. But it's really all based upon identity, weak credentials, um, being able to take control of these devices, the applications, the data, it's really the data, right? That's what that's where the money really is in a lot of these attacks. So we have to look at everything differently because it's, we were talking about before, this no longer the firewall is a perimeter where before, okay, you have a, a PC, it's plugged into the wall. You know, somebody have to like pick up a PC and leave with it. Um, but now, you know, you had laptops and tablets, mobile devices that are leaving that traditional perimeter. Right. It was just inside the walls of the corporate, you know, building and they're going out there, and they might have already had, you know, you have access to the internal resources while you're inside the network. Great, you put on your laptop, but you take the laptop out of the network. Right. Well, how are you, how are you being protected? Are you protecting that data at that point? You know, it's not just the access to the data from outside in, it's, you know, what happens to the data once it gets out, um, and making sure that's, that's protected. And a lot of these attacks are, yeah, it's around Identity stealing weak credentials and moving up in the organization to have higher and higher levels of, of access to get information. So, yeah, hopefully we can demonstrate a little bit today on where, you know, where Microsoft has seen that going and, and some of the solutions that they have around that. So a lot of different attack vectors that we really have to look at and mm -hmm. account for. Yep. So I guess you know, we come down to it, integrated identity. You know, that's that is. I think that's paramount because today there's a lot of organizations out there that, okay, you have users and you have your Active Directory credentials, wonderful. Okay, well, you have another set of credentials for Salesforce, you have another mm -hmm. set of credentials for your HR app, you've got another, all these credentials that you're managing and in a way it's almost impossible to require your users to have extremely complex passwords that change often across all of your applications and and the problem becomes as well is how do you monitor and make sure that those are being protected and that those are being, you know, right. the users are not getting locked out or, or whatever else. It becomes a huge challenge as, as the proliferation, proliferation of applications come to the organization. So getting an identity integrated is one thing, but now that you have one common identity, you really have to, man, you really have to make sure that's going to be protected, you know, and right. so you have to make sure that not only are you protecting it, but you're able to monitor and, and remediate it well right. um, from that standpoint. Well, it sounds like, and I think you're going to touch on this later, but it sounds like the traditional, I'll say, help desk model for management of credentials really is costing uh, our customers a lot of money. And being able to streamline the process with the integrated identity and credentials is really, really huge in terms of being able to, to save money. Yeah, that's just another facet, really, when it comes down to it, is that it, you're going to have lots of passwords or you want to make sure the passwords are secure, 
users are going to have, if you get down to this integrated common identity, well, that's going to be the, the, the master key kind of to all the rest of the right. application. So if they can't get in with that password now, that's critical. They can't do work, right? right? So now you have, oh, no, now help desk calls about this, and they're highly critical, urgent. You know, we need 24-7 whenever anybody's working anywhere to get my password reset. Well, there's solutions now. Do now Microsoft has self-service password reset. really mitigates a lot of that. I have some stats a little later on, on right. that I think really shows the value of, of having the cloud-based um, identity in this, in this matter. Um, so it really, just going through this here, like I said, traditional identity access management solutions, you know, usually on-prem, right? you have Active Directory, maybe you have some other investments that, that you've made as an organization. And now we have all these really pressing requirements that need to require to the same experience that you have on-prem to also cloud applications, anything hosted in the public cloud. And so what it comes down to is Microsoft Azure Active Directory can be that solution for this challenge, extending that reach from on-prem to identities to the cloud in a secure and efficient way. And when, in order to do that, basically, you just need a, one simple connection between on-prem and Microsoft Azure Active Directory in order to facilitate that. And then everything else is handled by uh, Azure AD, secure single sign-on to thousands of SaaS apps um, in any cloud by using the same credentials that exist on-prem. And then, you know, you don't forget the users, right? That's where we're talking about self-service capabilities around um, the self-service password reset. There's also ways to uh, get to an application that's hosted on-prem without having to use a VPN. Right. Um, so with this, am I, am I correct in assuming or understanding that with that single sign-on, you're federating a number of different third-party services? Uh, I'm not trying to advertise for other companies, but I'll use some examples like Salesforce or LinkedIn. Um, are you able to use that single identity to, to get to those different services? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And not only that, about using the single identity and federating with all these applications, Microsoft, they have at least now 2,600 these SaaS applications in their catalog where very easily you can set up this kind of federation um, for a single sign-on to these applications. But it's all the security layers that are on top of this common identity that Microsoft can help you manage um, to prevent threats from happening and, or identify them right. very quickly and, and being able to essentially it's protect, detect, and respond um, very easily. And we'll get into you know, where I think Microsoft is getting with that. Awesome. With that. Well, I know, like I said, I'm the, probably the old guard in the world of mobility management. And if you look at the traditional uh, mobility stack, and, and I saw this yesterday, uh, really with the meeting I was in, I saw the traditional stack and really where it started to fall short. You know, I, I've always talked about the stack as being MDM as the foundation, and I still think it is, uh, even in the, in the changing world that we're in. It's being able to control the APIs on the device and, you know, change things such as passcodes and cameras and stuff like that. So that's really, you know, part of the traditional stack. Yep. So that's, yeah, you see the standard MDM, you typically see some sort of a, a data container that with the traditional MDM providers is you containerize all the business applications and the data in a kind of a walled garden. Right. So that that's that's where they are, and they can't go outside that wall of guard. Okay, great. The user experience isn't always great. Sometimes right. you have duplicate applications, or you have to use some sort of third-party knockoff of Microsoft Office, for example, right. um, to get your work done. Uh, so not always the best user experience uh, with that. Well, and to my customer's point yesterday, it, it, it's secure in the containers, but what happens when it's outside the containers mm -hmm. on other devices? Uh, so that, you know, is, is one point in the whole ecosystem that a user has that maybe is secure, but it doesn't cover the whole, again, cover the whole gamut, at least in my mind. That's how I saw it. Yep. And that's something I think that brings a good point. The, talking laptops, desktops, I mean, Windows 10 is really changing the game from that standpoint. There really hadn't been a really good option otherwise um, to protect data and getting off the device or getting out to unsanctioned applications. Windows 10 and some of the things that are coming with that are it's really turning into a mobile device. Right. And um, EMS is definitely poised as a first-party product to manage you know, its Microsoft's um, operating system. And that's something we'll, we'll touch on that I think next week uh, kind of as a better together situation. Okay. There. I'll look forward to that. Yep.
and other pieces here, just traditional EMM stack, just to get an application into that walled garden, the container usually have to wrap that up um, into a you know some sort of custom SDK or wrapper uh, to be managed. A lot of applications might already be available from that um, that MDM provider or your line of business apps. You put in a wrapper and put it into that right. walled garden. Um, and there again, in terms of support costs, that can be that can be pretty expensive in terms of those uh, SDKs and having to, to wrap uh, applications. Um, I think what's appealing, you know, if I look at the Microsoft apps, um, those are enabled. And, uh, you know, it saves your IT department a lot of time. Yep. Yeah, and traditionally, um, other EMM providers may have a lot of on-prem, some sort of on-prem appliance or infrastructure that everything relies upon for that as well. So just a little bit extra um, configuration, sometimes custom scripts and that type of thing to get everything working properly. So that kind of brings us to, you know, where's Microsoft at, where they look, and I think they take, took a look at this from the other direction. They started, all the MDM providers originally, you know, they were out in the game first, and they were looking at security first, not user experience. And Microsoft's come to the game and said, all right, we're coming a little bit later, but I want to put this on its head. I want to look, we want to look at user experience first, empowering the end users, but also making sure security is paramount, but in that context. Right. Right. So what they do is a little bit different. Now they still, they have, you know, a native device MDM. I mean, with all these devices out there, there's only a certain amount of buttons and switches and things that you can change that are exposed right. from iOS, Android, those types of devices. So we're in a pretty level playing field for, from an MDM standpoint across the board. Um, we're, but the next layer is really where I think that EMS and typically Intune and all those pieces really shine. And it's, Intune is uniquely able really to manage and enforce app restrictions for Outlook, Office mobile apps, on iOS and Android. And that's something that no other MDM provider can do. It's only Microsoft that can manage those applications, that first party application experience, and provide class and consistent user experience for you know, the email productivity, collaboration, but at the same time protecting the corporate data. So what that means is that employees are now able to be productive with real Office, not Office-like proprietary apps right. with limited functionality. So great user experience, but with EMS, the corporate data is also uniquely protected at four layers, which uh, we'll discuss a little bit later on. I mean, other vendors just they just can't say that. Right. And uh, Intune also has its own um, app SDK wrapping tool to for organizations and developers bring their application under management with Intune. So those line of business apps, um, they already have a very wide large catalog, a lot of partners out there of applications that already have this SDK built in, you know, Adobe, Box, right. Citrix even, and a lot of, they have, I think, one of the largest MAM, like mobile application management um, app directories uh, out of all the providers out there, vendors, so that's, that's, fan, that's a huge, that's fantastic, that's a huge thing. Because by having those pre-staged, again, it's much easier for our customers to be able to move right into being productive and getting things out to their yep. users. And not only that, with the SDK, if you are wrapping an application up with that, now that application can inter interact with the Office mobile apps on that device. Interesting. Yeah. Isn't it? And, but then when it comes to data access control, you know, Intune is also able to manage access to internal corporate networks, uh, services such as Exchange on-prem, but there's not even any requirement for any email gateways or any servers to get that to work. Um, it can also manage, of course, access to other Office 365 uh, services too, like SharePoint Online, Exchange Online. Um, so minimizing the on-prem infrastructure needed, minimizing the complexity, uh, it's really just a first-class citizen when it's talking to especially all the right. you know, Exchange, SharePoint uh, services out there. So I want to kind of come in here. You know, we talked about the challenges here, and I want to really dive a little deeper into where EMS, I think, comes and meets the challenge here. So the, the needs that we've seen typically for customers is, you know, access for many devices, manage and secure productivity, support you know, iOS, Android, Windows, and all the apps that they use, preserve existing investments. And my, hopefully we'll show here that this is where Microsoft really stands up to all of this. So as really discussed, this rapidly growing mobile first, cloud first direction, it really becomes critical more than ever that IT has a way to securely control access to data while making the overall management easier. So enterprise mobility manages more than just device management that you get with MDM solution by itself. These devices are 
you guys, like I said before, only mobile due to someone carrying them. So we need to focus on how to securely manage the user, not just the device. So Microsoft has you know, introduced this answer to the enterprise level um, with EMS. So what is EMS? Um, a little bit deeper here than we did the first time around. The first focus really is managing identity and access to the environment. And in most enterprises today, entity, identity footprints vary kind of disparate. Um, on -prem, so you have your on-premises um, identity environment, which typically consists of AD and potentially other directories. And then you have those cloud services um, that your users may be leveraging, like right. Concur, Salesforce, Office 365, Box, sure. all of those, um, which all have their own set of credentials and passwords. So the first step is to create a common identity. Um, and then... So we're starting to set up the federation. Is that... Am I jumping ahead of myself here, or is that... No, that's, that's about right. So, yeah, you're creating that federation kind of between um, on-prem, your identity, and Active Directory, but using that through Azure Active Directory okay. to access all of your applications. So the first part of the story here is really the Microsoft Azure Active Directory Premium, and that syncs your on-prem AD uh, with uh, Azure AD with either a password hash or through federation, and also syncs your, your SAS credentials uh, from your applications there into a single source within Azure. So this single source becomes a foundation of the common identity as AD credentials now be used across all sources. Right. So it's important to know that thousands of third-party applications already have pre-existing connections um, to Azure AD, making this implementation really simplistic. Now, and this is the world uh, as we live in today and it's going to accelerate. We're going to see more and more cloud services and even customers that I called on, I have called on over the years, uh, initially said, oh, we're not going to cloud, we're not going to cloud. Now it's, we can't get to cloud fast enough. Yep. So it's accelerating and it's, it's reality. Yep, definitely is. I mean, due to the common identity then, Azure AD Premium can offer um, like single sign-on, multi-factor authentication, and self-service reset. So that really allows kind of the sunsetting of solutions like Okta, RSA, and Trust, Quest, Hitachi, because all of this is built in and it's a, a consistent user experience here. So we, we saw for a, a common identity with SAS and AD, but I mean, what about other on-prem solutions like HR, right. um, apps, ERP type systems? That level of integration is desired. Also have Microsoft Identity Manager, which is included in this. We're not gonna get too deep into that, but I wanted to mention it, it's one of those um, features that's included in EMS that's really, I don't wanna say it's downplay, but it kind of flies under the radar, let's say. And what MIM allows for is synchronization of on-prem directories, databases, and applications into on-prem AD, which would then connect to Azure AD Premium. Okay. So it kind of connects everything all together. So now that the identity and access management is place, what else is provided to complete the enterprise mobility management story? So we look at the mobile device and application management um, through uh, Intune. Intune allows you to manage across multiple platforms, as well as those thousands of applications. And also you need to start focusing on securing your information by layering in Azure rights management for encryption, identity, and authorization for corporate files and email. Then lastly, the newest addition to EMS is the advanced threat analytics, which is one way to look at ATA is to think about your debit card. So if you're in New York City and buying dinner, and then maybe five minutes later your card is, let's say, swiped in Russia, your bank flags your account for potential fraud due to unexpected location purchasing. Well, ATA basically is, it provides that same type of behavior and based analysis, but for Active Directory. Right. So it leverages machine learning, so you're able to identify suspicious activity within Active Directory and provide appropriate reporting and alerting. Um, so it can look at normal patterns and basically say this user, this user, these these credentials are not uh, behaving in the way that we expect mm -hmm. and and flag. Yeah, and be able to trace back that in, in the initial attack before anything can actually be compromised of value. Yeah. So. Digging into identity-driven security, and we'll run through this real quick. There's a, there's a lot. This is around Azure AD Premium, but a couple points was we talked about self-service password reset. I mean, that's in itself could save a ton of money for corporations that don't have a solution like this. I mean, according to Gartner, between 20 to 50 percent of help desk calls are password resets. Wow. And Forrester research states that the average help desk labor cost for a single password reset is about $70. So I did a quick calculation. So a thousand users, let's say each user calls the help desk 11 times per year, 
30% of those are password related and let's say that $70 per call um, is the cost of the organization. Well, in a year, it's like $231,000 just on password resets management there. Cost for EMS at the retail price, which is not many corporations are going to pay for at the retail price, they'll probably get better discounts. But at retail, it's $105,000 to cover every single user in a thousand user organization with EMS. Not only do they get the SAS cell service patch reset, they get the entire suite of EMS. So right there is just a really compelling reason to, to really look deeply into this. If you need to find a good ROI, you know, that's a good place to start. So it pays for itself. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. And the user experience is better, right? They don't have to, a lot of users dread calling the help desk. You know, oh, I got to call help desk and you got to go through the process and open a ticket and whatever else. They can just go online and to any device and reset their password in a secure way and get on with business, you know, getting right. on with work. You know, one thing it, it appears to me is, you know, in the years that I've worked with uh, IT organizations, we look a lot at the uh, user experience. But I'll kind of flip that on its head and talk about the IT experience. It looks like this is a pretty easy solution to manage, that you're not looking at a number of different disparate systems. It's one cohesive system from Microsoft that uh, is really built to talk to each other and work with each other. Yeah, I completely agree. A lot of this, even from some of the on-prem solutions, specifically around security and reporting, that information can be brought up into the cloud and be looking at it side by side with that cloud um, security reporting information. So yeah, because this an experience, less councils to deal with, administration is a lot more straightforward. Um, other things here, so because this is based in the cloud, there's a lot of things you can do from like machine learning and a lot of computation mm -hmm. that you just can't really dig in a lot of that data. It would be expensive to do that on-prem. So we get to utilize our cloud intelligence for security reports specifically, and you get to utilize Microsoft's kind of purview over the, the, the world of, I think there's something there's billions and billions of uh, Azure AD logins like every week. And they, Microsoft can kind of track the telemetry around that and bring that back to what's happening in your organization, whether mm -hmm. that's coming from a suspicious IP address or somebody stolen your, your credentials. And they have some very advanced security reports, something that you just can't get on-prem only um, right. without that intelligence that Microsoft has built into it. Um, advanced security reporting really is cloud only, but the, the advanced uh, threat analytics, the ATA, capabilities are the on-prem side of that, because customers are like, well, I saw something I have in the cloud, but how about my on-prem right. AD? Well, that's where ATA comes in place. That's why Microsoft made that acquisition recently. We're going to touch on ATA a little bit more next week. We're going to okay. dive deeper in there. Um, other sides of things, like, um, conditional access is something that's pretty unique as well, giving conditional access to Exchange, SharePoint, OneDrive for Business, and those types of apps only if the device is managed and it's compliant and the, the health is good on it. Um, that's something that's very unique. We'll probably touch on that a little bit more next week as well as cloud app discovery. Um, but right now, I'd like to show you kind of that advanced security reporting side of things um, uh, where it's going to be on an Azure AD. I set up a demo tenant here just to show you a little bit of what you can get out of this. So uh, here, it's just a dashboard in, in uh, Azure Active Directory for my demo tenant. Let's see if I'm still logged in. Okay. So it shows a couple things here where right away you can see security, you know, how users that are at risk and uh, view risk events. I haven't had any risky activity right now, but I'll, I'll go through a couple of the reports here. Um, you can look at the multi-factor authentication and see some usage on security and manageability. So we see the self-service password reset here. So some of the reports are really interesting. If you really use the machine learning, like signings from multiple geographies, right? That's kind of like that same idea. You log in here, but then somebody else uses your login and it goes successfully. Logs successfully in Russia. Five minutes later, it's like, well, you, there's no way you can travel you know, it's the impossible travel report, right? It's no yeah. way to travel there in five minutes. Obviously, there's a problem. So at first, you says, you know, auditing and just looking and reporting. But you can then, as you get a good idea of what your kind of baseline is, you can start enforcing.
things like, all right, whenever you see this type of anomalous activity, I want, you, I want to enforce multi-factor authentication or I want to block logins or something like that. Interesting. So, and that happens right at the, that, the common layer of that identity for all the applications across the board. And I, I seem to remember from you and I talking that when you're looking at adding, like for example, if, if, a, if it's felt that a user or a device is compromised, um, that multi-factor can be a pin that's presented to the user and that pin is something that they preset and they know. Mm -hmm. And by using that, they're identifying themselves as them and able to able to move on, but somebody in Russia, for example, wouldn't necessarily have that. Yep, and even so, not even just something you know, maybe something you have, where you can send a text message or make a call to your cell phone, authenticator app on your phone, um, in order to prove your identity right. beyond just the password. So, um, yeah, that's just, it's built in to EMS, and yeah, it's, it's very easy to implement, and it's a very good user experience in the end. So there are just a couple of ones here. The other ones, uh, which interesting, leaked credentials. Microsoft has a digital crimes unit that's actually working with a lot of security companies and trying to see what's happening in the darker part of the web. Um, and they'll see maybe there's blocks of credentials that are being sold. Mm -hmm. And they'll see that. They'll kind of flag your account as, hey, I th this might be leaked credentials. And then you can, you know, by an automated rule, say, all right, well, then automatically enforce multi-factor authentication or force a password reset for that user. Interesting. So. Yeah, a lot of great um, things you get out of this as well. So just moving on here real quick. Um, so mobile application management. So beyond mobile device management is really managing the applications and the data, as we talked about before. Now we're going to see, we're going to talk about a lot of times, we're talking about office apps, mobile apps for office. Um, just want a little disclaimer there, the office mobile apps are on devices like iOS and Android. You can only yet if you're subscribed to Office 365 and specifically the Pro Plus right. um, licensing there. You can still get those apps without being a subscriber. You can only give you like read only mm -hmm. um, there. But Microsoft announced as well, you know, another reason why we're talking about Office 365 and EMS is that Microsoft has recently announced that for their commercial space, they have over 70 million active users on Office 365. Wow. And out of all the companies that have Office 365, I think it's around 70% have are also licensed for EMS. So it's penetrating the market. It's kind of part of that better together story as well. So that's why, you know, when we're showing examples and stuff like that, that's why right. we're going to talk about office apps. Now, one thing that's also very compelling is this new idea of kind of MDM less MAM, um, not having mobile application management without mobile device management. Right. And you might ask, well, why? What does that what does that do for us? Well, traditionally you'd have you have to take over the entire device, right? That was the idea. Like the traditional mobility um, vendors out there would be like, yeah, we're taking over the entire device, but not the best user experience always. Now, for a corporate device that's owned by corporate, they own the device, so they should be able to take over ownership of the entire device with MDM. Maybe have a layer of the management of the applications as well on that. Right. But there's two scenarios where I really see that MDMless MAM really works as well, where if you have a, you already have an MDM solution that's, okay, it's really good at that MDM, like I said, most MDM is the same. So you already have one, you already made an investment, great, you're managing those devices, but you'd also like some application management and be able to use Office applications. Well, you can layer in Intune on top of that already existing MDM um, solution so that you can give your users that first class experience with the Office mobile apps and without having to do the containerization that other ones have to, right. have to do. The second one, which is um, really driven by this user experience in kind of liability as well, is like you don't necessarily want to take over control completely of a user's personal device. You know, they have their personal photos and they've got, you know, their documents and everything else. But that you don't really care about that as a corporation. You just care about their enterprise data. So now you can um, enroll that device and not in the entire device, just the applications into application management and just control those applications and that data. And if you, you know, need to just wipe it, you can just wipe just the enterprise data or the user can say, this is my device, I don't want this, these mobile applications anymore from the enterprise, right. I want to get rid of them. They have that option as well, kind of an opt-in type of experience. So, you know, what we're showing here is like a newly enrolled device and you have your managed apps and they're sitting right next to your personal apps on mm -hmm. that device. And then, so your managed apps are 
they are aware of each other of which ones are managed and you can the data is only allowed to go from those apps um, to each other so but it's an ecosystem basically with basically. those apps yeah. yep yep so they all just play nicely together now the thing that's really interesting now too is besides office there are some other apps out there there's this multi-identity idea of you might have Microsoft Word on your on your iPad and well you want to use that for personal but you also have work well, how do you keep that separate Right. Well, it's built in now to have the, the identity separate. So depending on where that data is coming from, it's coming from your corporate email, corp, other corporate apps into Word, it's going to be flagged as corporate. Everything else flagged as personal. So even within the app, you can't copy over from corporate to personal. Um, so it really makes it a better user experience. The user doesn't have, oh, which Word app am I using today? Uh, right. Is, okay. Um, so you can still have that control now and give a great user experience. That's very compelling. Yeah. And so kind of shows that you're here. You might have an email attachment from your uh, Outlook, your corporate account. You copy that into Excel. You say, all right, well, I want to go ahead and copy that to my notepad on my iPad. Nope, can't do it. It won't let you. Um, these are things that are not native in, in iOS, Android. It's something you just can't do natively. You have to have this layer on top of that. You say, all right, I want to, I, but I can paste it right into Word because that is corporately managed. Right. Not a problem. But I want to take that and I want to copy it in my personal OneDrive. Nope, I can't do it because that's not part of that enterprise application. But I can take it and put it into my OneDrive for business. Right? So I'm going to show a little bit of that right now. Okay. Um, skip this that's great. Stuff here. We are in the process of uh, moving Chris into a demo, which is going to be shown from my PC. So this is where the gremlins may start running loose. So bear with us as we, we make that switch. Right. There you go. Okay, so hopefully everybody can see that. So I have here these are applications that were all these are all managed by uh, the corporation. I've been already enrolled this device. This is kind of considered a corporate corporate device. It's enrolled in MDM, has MAM, has everything. Um, so yeah, sorry about the flash, buddy. I'm not sure what's going on there. Uh, but if we open up Outlook here. As we can see, that actually it can have a pin per app. So this is another part of the MDM list MAM, and we're going to show a little bit more of that next week of how that works um, specifically. But with this, you can you can maybe not have a, a pin for your entire device, but just those applications to get better user right. experience. So I have like a let's see if I have a, a good. Here we go. Here's a here's a Word document, right? So I'm going to open this up in Word from my my Outlook, my corporate. I'll just show real quick here where um, since it's coming down, it's prompting me for a pin. And it should be open up the invoice here. So okay, great. I got this invoice. Um, I want to go ahead and I want to save that off to somewhere else so I can work on that later, let's say. Um, oh, I'm going to put that in my Dropbox, right? So let's just go ahead and duplicate that and put in the Dropbox. Well, I can't, right? So the minister doesn't allow saving the personal location. Doesn't just say have a like, big error and then contact your help desk right. for help or something. It actually kind of tells you, hey, you know, this is a policy. You're not allowed to save here. So it's, it's helping the user be compliant um, and really kind of educating at the same time that, you know, this is a personal location. You can't put that there. So that was one of them here. Um, another thing too, so if I want to take this, this information, let's say I want to, let's just select all. So fine, all right, well I want to put this into my, I'm going to send a personal email real quick. So I copied that. Let's go back to Outlook. And this kind of demonstrates the multi, um, the multi uh, identity applications here. So Outlook right now I have two accounts set up. I have my corporate account, and then I also have this is kind of my uh, this is my personal account, uh, an Outlook, let's say. So I say, all right, fine. I'm gonna I want to just send a, an email message out here, and I'm gonna go ahead and copy this. So I go and there's no paste. Hmm. I can't put it in here, right? right? And just to show you, I'm not like you know, any blowing smoke or anything. Let's go back to my corporate account, which is part of this app ecosystem, right? So I go there, and now I'm going to go write a message. 
and I'm going to come on, paste. And there's my paste. Very and that's information. Right? So same application. It just knows the difference between, you know, is it personal or is it enterprise? Right. That's awesome. Yep. And the fact that you have that real easy separation and you can have multiple accounts in there, personal and work, but it's smart enough to know which one is which. Yep. That's that's great. Oops. I think that's not the monitor I wanted. <laughs> yeah. This is the Gremlin, again, the Gremlin portion of the program. All right. Okay. That's what I want. All right. So I'll just run through these real quick. and know we're, we're going a little over on time here. But um, so the four layers of protection here, like we talked about earlier, it really come down to this identity device application and data. And part of that, like we just showed with email and productivity, it's all uh, part of this, where you see that we have the identity, which was the corporate identity that was logged into Outlook. We have the device itself, which is being managed, the application, which is Outlook, and then the data itself, which was you know what you can paste or can't paste. We're going to show a little bit more about that from a, a rights management perspective. And so it really comes down to mobile data protection. And some of this, um, it's really a two-fold philosophy. First, Intune protects corporate data access from the device. So something like conditional access, where before the devices can access data, they must be managed and healthy. Um, once the device is enrolled and healthy, Intune enables the end users to access corporate resources such as email and internal websites. And at any point in time that that device becomes out of compliance, it will kind of block access again until it reaches compliance again. And it's usually, it's very good in terms of educating the user, telling the user, well, you're out of compliance, but this is what you need to do. Right. Right. And this is all, uh, it can all be set up to handle this automatically. So this is yes. working on policies that our IT department has set up. Exactly. This is all automatic. So you say, you know, OneDrive, Office 365, your on-prem, SharePoint, Exchange, you can't get access to that until you are enrolled in Intune. Once you are, okay, great. We're going to let, let everything open. Um, one interesting thing, we might show this next week, is you might have all these emails in your inbox, and all of a sudden you're not in compliance. It goes to one email, and it says quarantine email, saying, hey, you're out of compliance, this is what you need to do to get back in. And once you do everything, everything comes back. Um, so it's a, just a really straightforward experience. And the second part here is Intune protects corporate data cached on the device. So exam for example, with mobile application management, Intune protects and manages the data both in the apps and on the devices that users actually want to use. So with remote tasks such as selective wipe as well, IT pros can take action on devices that have been compromised to keep data protected and only remove the corporate data itself. Um, so, so if it's compromised or somebody leaves the organization, mm -hmm. you're taking just what belongs to the corporate corporation, not the user. Exactly. So those are, yeah, that's pretty compelling at that point. It makes a nice user experience when you're protecting the data. Right. So the last piece we really want to talk about is um, Azure Rights Management. So you'll see Azure RMS is sometimes what that's called. Now what this brings to the party here is file-based encryption, access control, policy enforcement, document tracking even, being able to revoke um, rights to a document, and even classification labeling so that you have different sensitivity levels, you have different policies. Um, this works across email, uh, any files really. In office type documents, you will get a lot more granularity in terms of, you know, okay, you can view and print, but you can't edit, right. and that type of control from a rights management standpoint, but you can at least say you have access to this file and you can read it, or you have full access, you can also write to any other file type that's out there. Um, PDFs, text files, I mean, you name it. And then it also works uh, pretty seamlessly with line of business applications too. So the idea is that you can then share protected files or just sort of files basically shared internally or share them externally either to other business partners or vendors, who knows, or share externally to other consumer even type um, uh, identities, people that you know, maybe you're working more with. It's the doctor's office, work with patients, and you, but you need to get data to them that's kind of encrypted and protected no matter where it's at. But that data, it follows, the encryption follows the file and the, the rights follow the file. And it's all based off of identity on who you say can open up that file and they have to prove their identity based on like logging in. See, I see that as really a, a compelling 
<clears throat> feature. And that goes back to my meeting yesterday. That's exactly what I thought of when he talked about securing his information, mm -hmm. uh, was the idea that regardless of where you're at, those mm -hmm. criteria that you've set are going to be enforced. Yep. But the key to this whole thing is on any device. Mm -hmm. We've gotten to a point now that it's not just on your Windows devices. You can do this on iOS. You do this on Android. It's integrated into the Office app, Office applications to make it a really easy experience and just straightforward experience. So it's really proliferated at almost any device that you can think of and in any part of the world. Right? So even Russia. Even Russia, right? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, something we might show next week is a little bit more of the advanced side of this, these features, which is the document tracking and you know, seeing where your documents have been opened and being able to revoke that as well, even on a map view across the world. That's great. So I just want to show a quick demo here. We want to switch over to the we'll switch back over to the iPad here. There you go. Good deal. So we have, um, there's a protected document here. So Bonnie here set out, sent a, this Northwind Traders acquisition materials and she protected that. And then maybe she said physically, she hit a button and said, this is sensitive information. I don't want anybody else to be able to open up sites inside the corporation. Or maybe there was a rule um, through exchange that said, oh, I see some sensitive information here, I'm going to automatically apply protection. So there's a couple ways it could go about that. But either way, she sent that out to Garth here, who's who I'm logged in as, and um, says, all right, well, there's a, there's a message, but, you know, here's the, the files that are going to be, and, and you can see permissions here, so Contoso Confidential uh, is, is what the permissions level is. And I'm going to open up, you know, Northwind, Financials here. In Excel. There we go. Just to show that, you know, we can open this up here. Okay. I'm gonna have to log in. I'm oh, sorry. Log in already. I'm just going to have to start calling you uh, Garth. Okay, right. yeah. So it opens up here. So I can see right in here with the there's something that says permissions what I can and can't do. So I'm allowed to edit, but I can't copy, share, or print it. Well, let's challenge that notion, right? Um, so if I go back to Outlook, I've already sent this to my personal account, basically. Um, within within Outlook, say, well, I've sent it there, but I'm going to open it up, and maybe this is uh, another user really that has a this account. It's not really me, but here it is, shows up in the inbox, and it says, oh, that's interesting, so it says it's a, this message is an RP message, so it's a protected message, and so I can't, I can open it using Outlook, which, okay, I've got this, this is Outlook and everything. Let's go ahead and try to open the message that was, that was sent here. Because even the message, not just the attachments, was right. protected at this point. Say okay. Well, I want to open it. It's, it's I can't even get to it at this point because I my identity doesn't let me get there. And if I go to the uh, I'm like all right. Well, I saw some attachments here. Um, let's try to open that up here. And then as a user that's um, considering not being Garth here, uh, I'm not going to be able to log in to to even open this up here. So this is just one example of that. Um, you can have it set on keywords, or if there's uh, social security numbers, credit card numbers, whatever else, you can use Exchange to, to apply this protection, and it follows the document wherever it goes. So this is just an example of just showing that you can open it on an iOS device. It's not something you could do 
uh, even a little while ago on there. Okay, so I'm probably still logged in as Garth, but so it's just interesting that now you can you can follow the document anywhere, and whether it's through email or maybe it's your OneDrive for Business or SharePoint site that automatically applies certain permissions to the files. You can say only people within the organization can open them. Specific people outside the organization can open it, um, or specific groups only within the organization can open. So there's a lot of different use cases. You can go on for I can go on for you know all day about this. This is this is a very deep subject, but uh, I just want to scratch the surface. Yeah, I was going to say I look at this and this is this is definitely powerful. And to me, this is really taking. Uh, I don't even want to say mobile device management because it's more information management, but it's taking it to the next level. And that's really what we haven't seen in mm -hmm. the industry is something that's this compelling. Yeah, and really what comes down to it, there's no other solution like this. No other solution that can have this, this file level encryption that goes across all your devices and integrates so seamlessly with all the office applications. Um, and other vendors have realized this. and. Specifically, they announced that Citrix and Microsoft are going to be working together really heavily because Citrix has a couple of things that they do uniquely, mm -hmm. and Microsoft, obviously, as we saw, has some things that they can do uniquely. So they're trying to work together to show, you know, if somebody has a Citrix environment and it's using something like some mobile, you can use that as well as some of these really great features of EMS, and they're better together. So it's really interesting to see partnerships like this to, to start to formulate. It's fantastic. So as we're wrapping up here. Yeah, I was going to say as. Go ahead. I'm sorry, Chris. I cut you off. Go oh no, right I'm ahead. saying wrapping up here. It really comes down to, you know, where what's your next steps? You know, how can Cortec help? Right. So. Yeah, I would say you know as the uh, mobility practice manager, this is, you know, where I would love to, uh, you know, get with you, and sit down, look at your use cases. Uh, we can do an ROI analysis, and Chris shared the uh, example of the password reset. And just the amount of money right there that you save with a solution like this. So we can help you find those savings, and then you know, look at policy design and implementation uh, out to the users or deployment out to the users. So you know, please don't uh, hesitate to call us. We'd love it actually. Uh, and I, I again, Chris, can't thank you enough. Before we wrap up, I, I would also like to thank uh, Hannah Bagley, who's our marketing manager, uh, who's sitting in the room. Without her. Uh, these webinars would not be possible. So thank you, Hannah. Very well. Uh, do we have any questions from the audience before we? We do. Uh, first question: How can we find out which applications are supported by Azure for support single sign-on, um, and what if the application is not one of those supported? Gotcha. That's a great question. So, real quick, I just pull up the Active Directory Marketplace here. This is where they show there's over. 26, so 2,630 applications that are included here. You see a spattering of them here. So this is where you, you can just search real quickly or go by category and see where these applications are. Um, and you see what level of integration they have. So full user provisioning, federation, if it's just like saving the password and having single sign-on. There's a few different um, kind of levels of single sign-on that it provides depending on uh, the application provider. Um, and as well, if it's not in here, and as long as the application supports something like OAuth, SAML, um, or if it's just a web page front end, you can bring that in as your own application in the SSO. It's not going to be in the public space here. Or maybe you have a line of business application that you want to enable SSO for. You can bring that in. So yeah, that's, it's a really great thing that you're not just limited by the list here. Great question. Great. Fantastic. Any other question that we have here? Um, actually, you know what? We had one more thing, one more slide here. I just want to make sure we were missed. We didn't have this. We have our our next webinar is going to be our part three is going to be next week. It's going to be on Wednesday, not Thursday. So please be mindful of that. But we're going to take continue our deeper dive into the components of EMS, specifically around advanced threat analytics. I think we're going to look as well in cloud app security, cloud app discovery, um, the MDMS MAM. We can show a couple demos there, um, and then really the better together story around. Office 365, what's in Windows 10, what's coming with Windows 10, how does that all fit together with right. EMS? I think that's really going to be a, a compelling um, uh, webinar. So I hope everybody can join us. And again, you know, invite your friends. 
<laughs> you know, we're also going to have these recorded too, too. So if you that's right. really can't make it, definitely you know find the recording and and watch that. And I really look forward to it, Chris. Again, this has been the first two have been great. It's been nice having you here and being able to learn a lot about EMS at a much deeper level. So thank you to you as well. Yeah, thank you, John. Thanks okay. for having me. And if anyone has any uh, further questions, please enter them into the question box. Oh, there's a question. That's a good question. I just saw it come in here. So the question was around um, how do you get started with EMS? Where, what's the first steps? How do you purchase it? So. Uh, really, you can do, start with a trial, a 30-day trial, but I would highly recommend using a partner that has competencies in this area to really help guide you through all these pieces and where they fit into your, your environment. Um, Microsoft has a lot of, of typically a lot of funding and planning days if you have an enterprise agreement that you can leverage. Now, actually purchasing it, you can do direct, so it's through a credit card. You're going to get the retail price, so it's, you're not going to get you know, any discount there, but that's definitely available. If you have an enterprise agreement, that's usually the best way to go for pricing, especially when it's combined with existing licenses like CoreCal, eCal. Right. There's some bridge ways to get there, and you get a significantly discounted price off of what you would get for retail. I would highly recommend you get with your, you know, your partner, your Microsoft rep, your licensing provider to see what those prices look like. And then the last option is, um, it's a little bit newer. It's just CSP, as you might be hearing this around, it's the cloud solution providers that can provide this directly to you and to your tenant. They can also offer typically a, a somewhat of a discount off of what the retail is, but they help you to manage all of that and um, you can go through them. Uh, Cortec it actually is a cloud solution provider as well. Glad um, you said that. Yeah, we just recently um, have, have really been ramping up on that, getting a lot of customers involved. It's just a great way to have a, a good relationship with the customer and they come to us and we can provide support for them as well for their cloud services. So, yeah, great question. Awesome. That is a great question. Do we have any other questions? Uh, I think that's the last one. Um, so thank you all for joining. Uh, as Chris mentioned, next week's um, the part three wrapping up uh, the deep dive of EMS is on Wednesday. We will be sending out the recording of today's uh, part two, so you will all have that. But again, next uh, the part three is next Wednesday at 10.30 a.m. Uh, Eastern Central Time. So thank you all for joining, and we look forward to seeing you next week. Yeah, thank you everyone for taking time out of your day. Thank you. It's greatly appreciated.